Hello, historians, and welcome to another Purple Shirt History. Today, we're going to continue with the AS curriculum, the international option, and the first part of it, which is called Empire and the Emergence of World Powers. We will see how the emergence of imperialism in Africa and Asia affected Europe and affected the areas of colonization. We'll look at some different books that are recommended by Cambridge and another few that I think that are quite good for you to read to really ensure you have great subject knowledge. If you find this video helpful, please just take two seconds to hit the subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. So now you can sit back, relax, grab a notebook, and enjoy the video. Access to History for Cambridge International AS Level, International History 1870 to 1945. This is the recommended book on the Cambridge website for the course, and I recommend it as well. It's a good overview of all of the topics that you need to know for the exam. However, reading this book alone, in my opinion, is not enough to get to the highest levels for the exam. What you need to do is to read some additional books on each subcategory. So I'm going to show you a book right now called The Scramble for Africa. It is a seminar series book, and it is an excellent book for this subtopic about the age of imperialism. The international option has the age of imperialism, or emergence of world powers, whatever you want to call it, the League of Nations in the 1920s, the League of Nations in the 1930s, and China and Japan as its four main components, or subcomponents, I should say. All of these subcomponents deserve a book of their own, and you should be reading multiple books for the course. This will really give you the background knowledge that you need to do well. Here is the cover and contents of the seminar series book, Scramble for Africa. This is an excellent book for learning about the subcomponent, about the emergence of empires. Why is it an excellent book? Few reasons. It will go over all of the major players, European powers that are trying to colonize different parts of the world, uh, in this case, Africa, for resources, for glory, for uh, getting a leg up on the other European powers in this competition for supremacy. There's also a number of documents at the end of this book which are really invaluable when the year of the scramble for Africa and the emergence of European empires becomes the paper one question, the documents question. So these books have tons of documents at the end. If you study and practice with the documents at the back of this book, you're really going to put yourself in a good position to do well on the paper one of your exam. Just looking briefly, part one, the problem, introduction, the African background, the Victorian image of Africa. I'm going to just briefly talk about the Victorian image. So this is the era of Queen Victoria in the mid 19th century, which is a high watermark for British power. It is strengthening itself due to the Industrial Revolution, due to the victory over the French in the Napoleonic Wars, and it is really trying to expand and show that Britain is the dominant force on the oceans through the Royal Navy and economically through the Industrial Revolution-powered textile manufacturing uh, steam power of railroads, and so on. So the Victorian era is something you need to really know quite well. There is a bit of morality in terms of British society and the values that they try to impress upon its colonies. There is a class system being formed. We see a lot of different types of aspects of British culture beyond language and beyond religion that will be uh, brought to the colonies of Africa from London. Part 2, Analysis, the British Occupation of Egypt, 1882, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, Fashoda, and Anglo-French Agreements of 1904. First things first, the Suez Canal. You can write that down because it is a quite critical aspect of the scramble for Africa. Who would control the Suez Canal? that would connect the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea and be a huge conduit for world trade. 
Would it be the French? Would it be the British? Would they agree? You'll just have to find out. For any European power to control it, they would have to have political control of Egypt as well. So the book will detail that. West Africa is primarily the domain of the French. So if you look at West Africa in terms of uh, the top portion of Africa and the Muslim and Arab world, the French have quite a strong control of Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, so on and so forth. But the British in West Africa have colonies in Nigeria, in Ghana, and other places. So there is some deep rivalry in West Africa, where the French actually have a strong position vis-a-vis the British. East Africa, we see again the British have quite a strong hold on places like Kenya, Uganda. They want to have a line of control starting in Egypt and going all the way down to South Africa. So we'll talk about somebody like Cecil Rhodes in this book, who is a unabashed imperialist, and there's a lot of cartoons and stuff that show him with one foot on Egypt and one foot on South Africa, uh, calling him the Colossus astride the continent of Africa. South Africa, a lot of things going on in South Africa. We have the Boers, who were the Dutch descendants that moved to Africa. We have the Zulus, native, many different native tribes in South Africa. And then we have the British trying to control South Africa for its myriad of resources. There's a number of different states And eventually the British will have a series of wars with those Boers, those Dutch-descended South Africans, and we will see the impact of that. Fashoda and the Anglo-French agreements. This is getting towards the end of the scramble for Africa when everything is pretty much settled. We're going to see it transition then into the alliance system, which will then lead up to World War I. And then part three, we see the conclusion Did the scramble for Africa lead to more cooperation or more conflict between European powers? This is something that you'll have to think about and answer yourself. If you'd like to pause the video, you can look at the different aspects that are listed here on the right-hand side. I won't go through each and every one, but I think ones that I would pick out in particular, like I said, is the Suez Canal, Cecil Rhodes, and the Fashoda incident. These are the three key things. All those other things are worth knowing, but definitely a lot of questions based on the Fashoda incident, the Boer War, Cecil Rhodes, the Suez Canal. Also not mentioned previously was Germany. Germany was a newly created country in 1871, and they wanted to get in the scramble for Africa. This all comes to a head at the Berlin Conference of 1885, And Germany does get colonies in East Africa and Southwest Africa to add to their growing imperial ambitions. Here are the four key questions for this particular subtopic. Why was imperialism a significant force for late 19th century Europe? You will learn about all this in that Scramble for Africa book. You will learn for the domestic support, meaning this is the age of nationalism in Europe, the 19th century. So with the formation of Italy, the formation of Germany, nationalism is really a driving force for unifying those countries. And in the other more well-established countries like France and the UK, we see nationalism riding very high at this time period. You'll see what new imperialism is and the economic political motives for imperial expansion, meaning what were the reasons that they were undertaking this? Well, obviously, one of the key aspects is raw materials, and markets. So when it says economic motives, you're going to have to look at both sides of the coin. So extracting raw materials and selling finished goods to new markets overseas. Political motives are more about national prestige, more about one-upping the other European powers. For the impact of imperial expansion on international relations, this is one of those things that you're going to have to look at. Did it really affect relations between countries in a negative, neutral, or positive way. There are some examples of European powers cooperating. If, it, if you see this, looking at that second bullet point, it was talking about the Boxer Rebellion when the European powers did cooperate with each other to put that rebellion down. 
But in the very next bullet point, we see tension between Germany and Britain over the Boer War and the actions in South Africa. And then finally, we see the countries of Europe come together to sketch out some ground rules for the colonial possessions in Africa. Japan is a quite interesting country in the imperial age. It is one of only two countries in Asia that is not colonized, the other one being Thailand. And how do they manage to pull this off? Well, in these bullet points, you'll see the reasons for rapid modernization and military development. Gunboat diplomacy by the U.S. in the 1850s was a major factor. International recognition of Japan as a world power. So we see this thing called the Meiji Restoration. It is the modernization drive in the second half of the 19th century. And in a shockingly short amount of time, Japan goes from being a feudal society with lords and peasants and samurai and a lot of this feudal architecture of its society to a relatively modern and formidable military force. And they win a number of battles, which are quite shocking at the time, over China, over Russia, and we see them continue on into World War I and where they are on the winning side as well. Lastly, why did the USA emerge as a world power? The impact of closing the frontier on foreign policy. So by the 1900s, we see that there are no more areas left to conquer within the continental United States in terms of land that was occupied by Native Americans. That's all finished by the 1890s. So what does this do to the psyche of America? This has gone over in great detail, and you should know how the ending of the frontier, which was always a big thing in the American imagination, how the closure of that on the mainland of the United States, what is the United States today, affects its foreign policy. We see things like the annexation of Hawaii. We see the Spanish-American War. We see a number of events that work out quite well for America in terms of increasing its international standing. And it is a bit of a foreshadowing to the 20th century being the American century. We see explosive economic growth during the Gilded Age. After the U.S. Civil War, we see the U.S. becoming a manufacturing powerhouse, surpassing Britain and Germany and all of its rivals to be the largest industrial power in the world. And we see the effects of American capital and business spread all over the globe with different foreign policy decisions being made for big business and for the expansion of American economic strength. The Spanish-American War is a resounding success for the U.S., the Splendid Little War, as it was called, against Spain where the U.S. has a crushing victory, and it really announces to the world that the U.S. is going to be a power that needs to be taken into account in international diplomacy, and how the U.S. affected the First World War, why the U.S. joined the First World War, and how the U.S. came out of the First World War. These are all important things. The before, during, and after, we see the U.S., we see the country change a lot from the announcement of the war and its participation in it to the ending of the war.